Good morning and welcome to the uh, Digital Supply Chain Institute's eighth blockchain collaboratory. Uh, thank you all for joining in uh, whatever time zone you're in. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm Sean Muma. I uh, am the technology research leader for the uh, Digital Supply Chain Institute and I'll be the moderator for today's, uh, today's meeting. Uh, we hold these sessions uh, periodically to inform our members on current technology trends and have recently focused on the enablement of uh, enterprise blockchain networks, which is uh, the focus of our discussion today. Uh, and we'll focus in on the, uh, the EU general data protection regulation and its impact on, uh, on blockchain when using it as a uh, enterprise workflow automation tool. Uh, so again, thank you for joining. And as we get started here, let me turn it over to George Bailey, the Managing Director for the Digital Supply Chain Institute. Uh, George. Yeah, thank you, Sean, and welcome everybody to this uh, meeting. And I'll just say a few things to explain a little bit about the organization that we're part of. Not all of you are, are members of the Digital Supply Chain Institute, but I think all of you will be interested to know uh, about what we do and how we do it. And uh, we are, a, as it says on the slide, uh, a leading edge research institute that's focused on where digital supply chains are headed, where they're going. And I think there's three things that make us uh, especially different from any other organization out there today. The first thing is the quality of our membership. We have uh, a whole set of leading edge companies, great companies from around the world who are part of the Digital Supply Chain Institute. And in all cases, it's the very top of the house that represent their company. So we have, for example, uh, Colgate Palmolive, a fabulous company, and their head of supply chain is a member. And their CIO is also a member. Uh, and participate heavily in all of our work. Uh, same thing is true for Dell and SAP and so forth and so on. So we're really lucky to have high quality membership, not just the companies, but also the people who represent those companies. And it's a mix of uh, large companies from around the world, but also some leading edge and innovative new companies. So for example, uh, in Chile, we have uh, a company called Anastasia or Anastasia. And uh, you know, their, their founder and, and leader is on the call with us today. So large and small companies, great companies, high quality. Second thing that makes us different is the kind of work that we do. We do applied research. We do work about what does it take to really get the benefit of a truly digital supply chain and how to make sure that's executed uh, as rapidly as possible. Uh, and you know, our founder is uh, Sam Pamazana, who was the CEO and chairman of IBM. And he makes sure that whatever we do is not theoretical, but applied, something that can be done implemented, executed, and result in superior financial returns. So it's the quality of the research. And the final thing I'll mention that makes us different is we have the really high quality meetings around the world that bring people together to share ideas and uh, learn from each other. So, uh, and this is a big asset. So we, you know, we had one uh, recently in Santiago. We had one before that in Waldorf. We are gonna have one this year in, uh, Belgrade and another one in Dallas. And in each case, these meetings are sponsored by a leading company uh, and also uh, held in a, in a venue that's really special. So uh, we generally have about 100 or so top executives attend. And the idea sharing that goes on is simply, simply extraordinary. And the amount of networking that happens as a result of those meetings is also extraordinarily positive. So those are the three things that, uh, that make us different than other organizations. And we've been focused on the things that really help a supply chain be successful. So, for example, algorithms. Uh, but the one we're talking about today is very special it's supply chain uh, using blockchain. And this is, this is something that since 2016 we've highlighted. We said, you know what, supply chains really could use the value added of uh, a blockchain system. Now, what we know... Internet. It's just not true. But on the other hand, when you apply it correctly, you can get substantial gains. So we have one member company uh, that we work with extensively who achieved 33% reduction in cycle time, 30% improvement in the productivity, meaning less cost, and 11% improvement in quality. So that's really a breakthrough result that happened because blockchain just worked that well. Uh, so you're here, uh, the panelists today talking about how that happens. And you're also going to hear about how you need to do blockchain in the right place, but also taking into account the legislative environment that we, uh, that we live in around the world. And that's gonna be a big focus of this discussion. So 
Uh, Sean, I'll, I'll turn it back to you now, thanks. Okay, Th thank you, George. Uh, we're gonna focus in today on, uh, on the paper that we wrote uh, on, uh, on uh, blockchain and, uh, and GDPR. Uh, we wrote it in conjunction with, uh, with Slaughter and May and uh, Kravas, Swain and Moore. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, partners from those organizations with us today that, uh, that will take us through the, uh, the research and the, and the findings. The papers are, there's two versions of them. First, the long paper, the full version is March of the Blocks. Uh, and, then, uh, and then there is a, a shorter version uh, called the right to be forgotten meets the immutable, talking about the fact that once you write to blockchain, it's, uh, it's immutable. Uh, so how does that uh, in intersect with, uh, with the uh, data privacy uh, regulation? Those papers are both available on our website. In addition, the longer paper, March of the Blocks, is available on PageTiger. Uh, uh, please uh, download those, uh, read them. You'll find them, uh, find them interesting. Uh, so with us today, uh, authors of the, uh, of the paper, Rob Sumroy uh, from Slaughter and May. Uh, he is a, uh, a data protection uh, expert, uh, one of the foremost in his field. Uh, so he will uh, lead the conversation in the paper, and Dave Kappels will support him, who uh, is one of the form foremost uh, attorneys in, uh, in IP. Uh, Dave ran the, uh, the U.S. Uh, PTO, Patent and Trademark Office, for, uh, for a number of years uh, as Assistant Secretary of Commerce. Uh, unfortunately, Jody uh, Clayworth was going to join us today. He is the founder of Marine Transport International. And we used MTI uh, as, uh, as the example uh, within, uh, within the paper. Uh, Jody unfortunately had a uh, medical emergency today uh, and, uh, and can't make it. Uh, so uh, you're, you're stuck with me uh, backfilling his role. Uh, next slide, please. What we'll do is, uh, is we'll walk through, uh, tell you a little bit about MTI, uh, talk, talk a lot about the paper and then, uh, then wrap it up with a little round table discussion before we open up to, uh, to questions. So a little background on MTI, which, uh, which I mentioned we used as, uh, as, as the example throughout the paper. M MTI is, uh, specializes in blockchain for the shipping industry. Uh, Jody and his team have, uh, have been in the shipping industry for, uh, for 20 plus years. And they have formed a, uh, have developed a, a blockchain, they call it an adapter, uh, that sits between uh, systems of records such as SAP and the, uh, and the blockchain database uh, architecture. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, has enabled uh, MTI to, uh, to then uh, develop uh, pilots with, uh, with the Port of Rotterdam and also Hull in the UK. And, uh, and they have formed a close working relationship now with uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, uh, as, uh, which is, is exciting times, of course, with, uh, with Brexit. Uh, Jody approached us uh, probably about six months ago, said, gee, you know, I understand shipping, I understand technology, I understand blockchain, but, uh, but people are asking me about GDPR compliance, and I don't understand that so well. Uh, can you help us? Uh, so we, uh, we kicked into gear, uh, talked, to, uh, talked to Dave and Rob, and uh, we said this is an uh, interesting subject for us. Uh, there's nothing out there today that, uh, that provides guidance on the issue. In fact, there was very little at the time about G GDPR uh, compliance in general. Uh, we got together and, uh, and, and wrote the paper that we'll, uh, we'll talk about today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Rob, if you'd like to pick it up. Sure. Uh, thank you, Sean. So yeah, it's um, a pleasure to be presenting here um, on this. I would say this slide and the next one, they're both overview slides. The first one is an overview on blockchain and the second one is an overview on GDPR. And the challenge to summarize blockchain in a page or GDPR in a page, a page is, is always a bit of a tasty uh, challenge, but let's give it a go. I think we're assuming that most of the people who are listening in on and, and watching on this webinar will have some idea about blockchain and distributed ledger. So we're neither going to go back to the beginning, nor are we going to go very deep into technical explanation. 
because of the time. But what we're trying to do here is describe some of the facets of blockchain and distributed ledgers that are relevant to the question as to whether this technology can comply with the privacy requirements around GDPR. So, you know, one thing we know about blockchain, the I'd say one of the, the great things about the technology is that um, it, it, each block in the chain is a, uh, a measure, uh, it's a collection of data. Uh, and the, uh, each block then also contains a hash of that data. Uh, and every time you add a new piece of data on, a new block on, it not only has all of the information from that block, but it will also contain all of the hashes of all of the previous of the previous block and so in that way it becomes a chain um, and it also means therefore that if you make any change to any block along the chain it will not be consistent with the hash of that block and that's what breaks the chain so when people say the blockchain is immutable what we really mean by it is it's an absolute verifiable um, um, record of the truth and it is very easy to see where it's been tampered with that's what blockchain is. Why is it useful for people like MTI? We're going to come and look at their case study in a minute, but it works very well as a technology to do distributed ledgers. Now, distributed ledger is exactly what it says on the tin. It's a ledger, so it's a record of data which is distributed. In other words, it's not just in one place. There isn't one official record of data which is controlled by a party or a person or an appointed uh, custodian, but rather the network of nodes or the network of participants, everybody on that network has their own copy of the ledger. And because it uses blockchain technology, each one can, on a consensus basis, check that it says the same as everybody else's. And as long as the majority of people in that network have a record that says the same thing, that is the verifiable truth. And that's basically how blockchain distributed ledgers work. And as you can see from this slide, it uses powerful encryption technology, which means people can control what they put up there. And there's a lot of um, an ability to keep things private on the chain and to control it, make sure it's not tampered with. Um, it's an ad only ledger, a bit like bank ledger. So once something's on there, it's no, never taken off. It's just you add to it. Um, the two sides of the ledger will always, um, will, will always add up to each other. And the final thing I'll say in the overview is that there are many flavors and styles of blockchain, but two distinctions it's worth thinking about, certainly from the GDPR compliance perspective, are whether a blockchain is public or private on the one hand, and whether it's permissionless or permissioned. So just to very briefly explain that, as it says, as you would expect by the words, a public blockchain is one where anybody can join, there are no rules, Anybody, who's got, anybody who downloads the software can basically download uh, the blockchain and keep a, a record. And as long as they've got sufficient processing power, then they can be part of the blockchain. Whereas a private one is a club and you have to join it. You have to be given permission to join. There are rules and governance around it. And then permissionless versus permissioned. Well, again, it's a similar thing, but permissionless means anybody can add to the blockchain, anybody can add any transactions, anybody can add any data. Whereas permissioned, it's controlled by the rules of that, by that distributed ledger. And so, although people talk in very general terms about blockchain, it is important to think about whether something is a truly public blockchain in the very broad philosophical sense or more private, and whether it's permissionless or permissioned. So I think, Sean, I mean, I'm very interested for you or for David to, to add in anything in terms of the overview, but from our perspective, those are the factors of blockchain technology that make it an interesting case study for GDPR. Yeah, yeah, right, Rob, Dave here, and, and thanks, that's a, a great summary. I, I, you know, I would just add a couple of points. Scoping out and taking a, a look at the big pictures, you know, as Rob has explained, um, blockchain is a powerful technology and it, you know, and it truly um, uh, adds to what information technology can do for business. Um, if you scope up a bit and just, you know, ask the sort of the really big picture question, um, what does blockchain do, you know, sort of on the level of the internet? The internet en enables people anywhere in the world to get access to information and and now business processes um, 
put in place and promulgated by others. And um, the blockchain for its part and the, the concept of blockchain at its highest level is really about trust. And this is why you're going to see in a minute how, how it works so well in an application like MTIs. But, but blockchain fundamentally, you know, because of the aspects that Rob explained, enables people who don't know each other to gain trust in one another and businesses that don't know each other to trust one another and people who don't know businesses and people and businesses who don't know people to nevertheless trust them. It also fundamentally changes the nature of the way we look at um, systems, databases, and information technology because it enables us to reimagine um, what had historically been centralized systems by definition because we needed one trusted source for information, whether it was the government or a single business or whatever, to reimagine those centralized systems as distributed systems where there's no single point of trust, but trust comes from the ability for all the participants to look at and verify what all the other participants are doing. So I'll stop there, but I just thought I'd add those sort of big picture points and back over to you, Rob. Thank you. That's, that's great. And Sean, I think we can move on to the next slide because now we're going to have a look at an overview of GDPR before we then tie them together to answer the critical question that MTI were asking us, which is, can you have compliant GDPR compliant blockchain? So again, I'm sure many people on the webinar listening in will have heard of GDPR. It stands for the General Data Protection Regulation. It's an EU regulation, so it's law which applies to uh, the e in the EU member states. It became effective um, in the middle of uh, 2018. So as you can see, we are very close to the first anniversary. Uh, uh, I would say it's still very much new law. So what I mean by that is um, guidance from the uh, national and, and cross-European regulatory bodies is still coming out. Um, just by way of example, and I suppose by coincidence for this webinar, only yesterday we had the 10th plenary session of the European Data Protection Board, which is the groupings of European regulators um, who, whose job it is to ensure the implementation of GDPR in their national territories. And on the agenda for the discussion at the 10th plenary was blockchain. Uh, we have got hold of the minutes from it, but actually there's nothing written at all on that agenda item. So either they didn't discuss it. I don't know if anybody on this webinar was attending uh, the plenary session and can feed in some information, but either it wasn't discussed or nobody's written the minutes up yet. But it just goes to show that it's, it's, when we're talking about can you be compliant with GDPR when you're implementing a blockchain solution, that would be an interesting question if the law and the guidance were settled, but it's still a very moving feast. Um, it's not just relevant in the EU, which I think is an important point. Uh, the regulation has, in effect, cross-territory uh, jurisdictional reach. It is relevant to the processing of personal data or data about living individuals. It's relevant if that processing is in connection with an establishment in the EEA. So obviously lots of processing relevant to EEA establishments can go on outside of Europe. Um, it also applies if an entity is established outside of the EEA, but they're offering services uh, for sale or monitoring individuals in the EEA. So it does have quite a broad reach. The other reason why I think the question is relevant on a global basis and not just on a European basis is because there are new uh, data privacy regulations throughout the world. We're seeing states, and Dave Kapos can talk to this much better than I can, I can but state laws and possible federal laws in the US, but also in Asia uh, and across other parts of the world and uh, in um, uh, Australasia as well. And whilst they're not all the same as GDPR, a number of the principles and concepts that we see in GDPR are now common to a number of laws. So I think this question that CGE has, has raised is a really important one, which is how can we make sure we are able to implement blockchain and still protect people's privacy rights? So let's look at some of those um, principles of GDPR as they might apply to a blockchain solution. 
I think GDPR in itself represents quite a significant shift for data privacy, certainly within Europe, because it's introduced a concept of a fundamental right of an individual to control what is done with that person's data. So in other words, data privacy and compliance can no longer be a bit of an afterthought. So we can't have MTI implementing a blockchain solution and then as an afterthought thinking, oh, how do we get our lawyers to tell us that this can be compliant? They actually need to be designing the compliance with privacy regulation right in at the beginning. And this privacy by design principle, which comes out of Article 25 of the GDPR, is really intended to change organizational attitudes towards the protection of personal data to try and make it a pervasive issue that's considered by all organizations as business as usual. So MTI would be good to ask the question, I think, is one thing. But there are some other principles which it's worth us considering. For example, the person processing individual's data should only do it for the purposes that they have obtained that data. So it's this principle called purpose limitation. And so if you have a blockchain solution, which maybe can be used for various purposes, you have to always be engaging with the individuals whose data you're doing to make sure that those purposes are still consistent with the reason they gave you the data. There's another key principle around minimization. It's this idea that you should only process data to the maximum extent, or the minimum extent necessary, I should say, to achieve your legitimate aims. So a lot of new technology in the digital world, not just blockchain, but AI and other types of new technology, gets a lot of benefit from maximizing the processing of data. And that seems to be at odds with this principle around minimization. Um, there's also a key principle around individuals, so-called data subjects, who the data belongs to, having certain rights. And we're going to look at those in more detail in this webinar, but things like the right to know what data you have on them and understand what you're doing with it, the right to access that data, the right to rectify it if it's inaccurate, and in some cases, the right to have it erased, the so-called right to be forgotten. And then the final principle which I'm going to talk about is the fact that data, it's sort of a localization element, that data needs to be kept within the EEA unless either it's going to a territory where there are adequate protections and those are decided by the EU regulators or the, the various people exporting the data outside Europe and importing it uh, into non-European countries have entered into the, the requisite contractual arrangements. And so there's quite a process-driven um, administrative element to data leaving Europe. And when you have a global solution, which blockchain often is, that can raise issues. Um, the final thing I will say is that the regulators, like I mentioned, the European Data Protection Board and some of the national regulators are focusing very clearly on new technologies, things like blockchain. These are where personal rights are seen most to be at risk where individuals are perhaps least likely to understand what's happening to their data and what the impact of them giving you their data is going to be. And so, for example, they require what are called data protection impact assessments uh, to be carried out by people processing data. And so very much in the blockchain solution environment, you would expect people to be implementing these DPIAs, these impact assessments, to really understand what the impact is on the individual before setting up the technology. Dave, I don't know if you want to add anything around our general uh, GDPR overview. I've left the um, harsh penalties bit for you to underline. Yeah, thanks, Rob. I'll come back to that. Indeed, um, harsh penalties, as we're seeing from a few of the early investigations um, that have occurred, going after companies that are uh, that collect and process a lot of personal information in Europe um, in some cases American based companies but companies uh, you know think uh, Facebook as an example Google as another example that do lots of business in the EU and collect lots of data there um, and as Rob was alluding the the, the fines are up to four percent of annual turn. Uh, so they can be very serious. You know, just a couple of other comments that that I'll add again on the kind of the big picture level. As as Rob mentioned, the the GDPR applies not just 
to European companies and people, but to really anyone who's doing, broadly speaking, doing business in Europe. And that means it really applies globally and it applies to any uh, any company with a global business. What I'm seeing as a U.S.-based lawyer when I advise U.S.-based clients is that as I ask them a few questions, even if they don't initially think that they um, need to pay attention to the GDPR, we almost always find that they do. So think of GDPR very broadly. We may talk later about um, other, uh, as Rob alluded to, similar legislation in other places, but we can come back to that later. The one other comment that I'd add is um, that, the, as Rob mentioned, there are these rights in the GDPR, the so-called right to be forgotten, which, as Rob mentioned, is a qualified right, meaning it's not absolute, um, but in many cases, uh, a, a, a person whose personal information has been collected has the right to tell the party that collected it I want you to delete it. I don't want you to know about me. Um, and, then, and then secondly, as Rob also mentioned, there is an absolute right to rectification, meaning that if you as a person um, uh, find that a, a party that's collected data about you has false, erroneous, incorrect data, you have the absolute right to have it corrected. The reason I bring I come back to these two points is because if you think about them, and as we find, as I find in, in my day-to-day -day work, um, uh, advising clients, in order to comply with these requirements, your business must keep much better track of the data that it's collecting. I regularly run into situations where we'll be talking about this and the client at a technical level, like the CTO, the CIO at the client will say, well, wait a minute, we don't actually have a way to track how to find people, how to verify their information, how to verify their identity, um, even if they came to us and said, delete information about me or fix information about me. We don't necessarily have a way to find that information. So, so, so that gets to a major new requirement inherent in these GDPR requirements, which is a technical requirement to track um, correspondence between people about whose information is collected and where that information is stored so that you can comply uh, with the GDPR if and when you're asked to either delete someone's information or fix an error. So I'll stop there. But uh, I, you know, I just again would say GDPR has very broad, very global ap applicability, and it almost across the board requires some attention to information technology systems in order to comply. And, and back to you, Rob. Okay, thanks Dave. So if we just go over to the next slide, um, we, um, Dave uh, and I were uh, approached by uh, Sean and others at CGE with MTI as a case study uh, to, um, with this question, which is can blockchain solutions comply with GDPR. Uh, so the first thing we did was we said, well, okay, why, why will blockchain not be compliant with GDPR? And that's sort of um, up on the slide now. I think there's one more bill actually on the slide. I don't know if you can, there we go. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this because uh, actually what we're, what we're trying to say is how can it comply rather than what could the problems be? But just to set the scene, as you can see here, Looking, you know, on the left, we've got some of the key factors of blockchain, which we've already introduced, like, you know, it's a great way, it's a great ledger solution. So it's a fantastic way of securing and processing personal data. Just for those who aren't aware on the terminology, processing is really anything you can do with data. So any verb you can think of, including storing, but certainly, you know, processing, transferring, transacting, transmitting, whatever, processing personal data. But of course, as we've said under GDPR, there's a very important requirement of data minimization. So there is already a potential conflict. Then you say, well, blockchain is a fantastic solution because it's immutable. So in other words, it's there forever. The data cannot be deleted. It's there forever in time. And yet Dave Kapos from Cravath has just told you that there is an absolute right of rectification and a qualified but pretty firm right to be forgotten. So there's a conflict. Then we've got an issue that says that blockchain is global. It doesn't believe in national borders. That's the great thing about it. And we're gonna look at the MTI solution. It's frictionless. Data transfers 
everywhere immediately. There's a copy of the, of the ledger at every node. And yet GDPR requires data to be kept within national borders or certainly regional borders unless there's some very strict um, provisions. Okay, then we've got the fact that blockchain is new technology and it's being implemented in a way that maybe people won't understand it. And GDPR says this all has to be done with privacy built in. And the final point is that because blockchain is distributed and particularly if it's in a, in a, in a public blockchain permissionless, anybody could be on that network and anybody could be doing anything with the data. And yet GDPR has certain requirements that the individuals need to know who has the data. We call it the fair processing information. So who are the controllers of the data and what are they doing with it? So we, I suppose this is one slide of showing everybody that Dave and I understood the question. We could see that there were potentially conflicts. But when we did digging around this, there were a lot of people in the technology and legal sectors who were talking about the potential problems, but there weren't enough people from our perspective, there wasn't anybody who really was coming up with a clear vision or paper as to how actually these two could be consistent and how we could have a compliant solution. And we are, I think, if I'm right, Sean, we're gonna move on now to look at what MTI's particular solution does and why they have their solution. And then Dave and I will talk a little bit about um, how we think that the MTI solution can comply with GDPR. And, and actually, by the way, without, sorry, I, I, I know we don't have Jody on, and this is probably a slide Jody was going to speak to. I am more than happy to give this a go, or Sean, if you want to um, chat to this one, let me know. Yeah, why don't you go ahead, Rob, and I'll support you on it. Okay, cool. All right. So look, what we understood, um, and, and it was my first personal sort of uh, foray into the international shipping industry, so, um, so, so this was um, useful. Um, but what we understood from... Jody or what MTI are trying to do with their solution is to deal with some of these issues that you see on the slide. So um, when you ship large containers around the globe on the back of transporters, big shipping transporters, it won't surprise you that there's a heck of a lot of data that needs to be recorded. There's a lot of regulations. You need to know what's inside the containers. You need to know who's responsible for it. And you can't move them from one place to another without getting sign off. And this is a very uh, data intensive process, but with the current technology, there are certain problems. Um, one of which is that there's a lot of um, sort of lack of transparency and lack of trust in that um, the various uh, people playing in the market tend to be competitors and they don't like the idea that everyone will have access to everybody else's data. Um, and they don't like the idea also that they're going to be sort of operating on any particular platform or technology that one of them has developed. Another problem that they have is that uh, is around sort of this uh, discrete transactions creating friction in the data silos, which is as goods move around the world, what tends to happen is that each place it goes, the paperwork will be signed off and sent on to the next place, then it'll be signed off and sent on to the next place. And because this is not a distributed ledger, nobody further down the chain can start work until they've actually got the paperwork. And so it's a hugely slow process, very inefficient. Um, and there are a significant amount of regulations which require that extensive re records can be kept. And yet um, there's no obvious technology uh, solution for doing so. So far beyond my own technical capability or knowledge, people within MTI have developed and devised a fantastic solution, with, particularly with a very clever piece of middleware which means that it can, this middleware can sit on top of any network or blockchain network solution and enable all sorts of consortia of shipping companies and, and stakeholders within the shipping industry to have one um, distributed ledger in which uh, all the data can be um, stored in an encrypted uh, and secure manner uh, and everyone can access the data at all times. So everyone can know around the world where everything is happening and can act on it in a time that works for them. That is um, the solution that they have um, adopted in order to deal with the particular data problem that they have. Again, Sean, Dave, I don't know if there's anything you want to add before we move on to the uh, privacy by design elements of it. 
Yeah, thanks, Rob. To me, this is the uh, shipping is the perfect application for blockchain in creating uh, cross enterprise trust among uh, disparate parties that uh, that naturally uh, don't trust the information that they they receive. It's uh, it's not timely today. There's lots of middlemen, lots of friction in the process. It's just, it's very serial. Uh, I've seen uh, I've seen research that says uh, shipping costs could drop by more than thirty percent using a uh, automated uh, workflow solution such as blockchain, and uh, MTI certainly has been on the forefront of uh, of providing that sort of solution. Uh, back to you, Rob. Well, hey, hey, Sean. Thanks, Dave. Here, just a couple of further comments. Um, one is that uh, <laughs> the, if you're sitting there thinking, you know, so this is the shipping industry. How does privacy and personal information come up? Um, uh, th this, it's a good example of how it turns out uh, PII, pri you know, personal information, comes up just about everywhere. We were asking that same question, Sean and Rob and I, when we first started working with Jody on this project, um, scratching our heads saying, Jesus, this seems like it should be easy because you're talking about data about pallets of widgets and bills of lading and things about uh, information about objects, things that are inanimate and don't involve people's privacy data. And then as we began speaking with Jody and looking at some of the examples that he presented to us of the data that MTI is required to collect and manage, we began seeing things like signatures of people, um, driver's license numbers, photographs of trucks as they're entering and exiting um, ports. And, the, and in the photographs are included the bright, shining, smiling faces of the drivers of those vehicles and on and on and on. And so what we found very quickly is that even in an industry that you wouldn't think is characterized by large amounts of privacy information, there is all, there's plenty of it. And it turns out there's a lot of it. And with, with data being collected on such a ubiquitous and extensive nature now and just about everything that happens in the world, um, it, it won't surprise any of you on this call that almost no matter what industry you're in, um, you will be collecting and exposed to and dealing with lots of PII. The other thing that I thought I would just come back to for a moment, um, uh, uh, Rob mentioned this, was the importance of the middleware layer. And it really does turn out to be important as the crux of the solution. We'll come back to it in a few minutes, but I just kind of want to be sure everyone has in mind that um, the presence of a middleware layer in a blockchain turns out to be critical to being able to not only manage the technology, which is why Jody created it in the first place, but also to be able to manage the PII issues. And then the last thing I'll just mention briefly is that um, what you heard from, I think, both Sean and Rob was the challenges of getting parties to work together in this industry um, it turns out that we found from, from this experience and others um, and from the, the, the developing use cases for blockchain more generally that, uh, no, that, that it, no industry we've seen yet um, is destined to have a gigantic number of blockchains. And the reason for that is that network effects uh, play a, a significant role. And as a result, what we're seeing is that Industries can support at most a couple of blockchains, usually more like one for a solution like the one that we're talking about here that's intended to have global and, and broad-based implications um, and adherence. And as a result, to make, a, make this solution work from a business perspective, you've got to get the six, eight or so biggest players in the industry or more all working together and sharing information and putting these things together. And that comes back to Rob's point at the beginning that it's a real challenge to set these things up. We're finding that a joint venture structure is the one that works. And the reason I, I mention all of this is that having the joint venture on the business and legal side turns out to provide the opportunity for the governance that maps and matches with the governance on a technical level that takes place 
um, in the middleware. And it's the, those two things together, the, the business contractual legal governance through the joint venture and the technical governance through the middleware layer that um, it, it is the, if you will, is the eureka moment that enables blockchain and GDPR to coexist. And having set that up that way, I'll now turn it back over to Rob. Thanks, Dave. So if we just very quickly flip to the next slide, I actually think we've probably covered most of these, but this is just confirming that MTI solution raises GDPR issues. As Dave quite clearly says, there's a lot of personal data that you need or that you will come across in a ledger related to international shipping. Uh, the companies are established not just in the EU, but doing business uh, or processing in connection with EU establishment. Um, if you distribute the ledger, then this ledger is then going to be um, on computers, on, on servers all around the world. And that each one of those can then be a data controller or a regulated entity under GDPR. So, you know, I mean, it, it does pose issues. If we move now to the next slide, this, I suppose, summarizes our privacy by design solution for MTI. There's quite a lot of words on there. So let me just pick a few things out. The first thing that I think we would say um, is if you want to operate a public permissionless blockchain in true um, you know, fundamentalist blockchain distributed ledger fashion, it is going to be extremely difficult, we might say impossible, to comply with the GDPR if personal information, personal data is going to be processed on that. So I think the first thing that makes MTI's solution a sensible privacy solution is that it is a private blockchain solution and it is permissioned. And this goes to the joint venture that Dave's just talked about. And we're gonna talk quite a bit about having a proper governance process and governance arrangements in place between each of the participants. It is the ability to have participants agreeing to a set of rules and regulations and having it as a closed blockchain solution that enables uh, GDPR compliance. So the next thing uh, that as good privacy advisors we would always say is why do you need to process personal information in the first place? Now Dave has already told us that there's a lot of personal information, personal data in the shipping industry, but that doesn't mean that it needs to be on the blockchain. And so one of the things that we helped Jody and his team design for MTI is to have privacy, uh, if, if you like, kept off chain. And this relies on clever encryption technologies, but in effect, the data that needs to be on the chain, say it might be the record of a shipper's name and address and email contact details and maybe a, a photo scan of their signature, rather than that being put on the blockchain, that will be hashed with some strong technology, some strong, strong encryption, and it will only be the hash outcome of that um, personal information that's actually stored on the chain. And the actual personal information will be kept off chain. Then if anybody needs to access that personal information, the blockchain technology will give them the hash and will explain to them how in effect they can get hold of the information through the off-chain governance route. And they will then get access, if they need it, they'll get access, maybe proof of identity off-chain. So the ledger still does its job properly. It still has data passing around the world in a frictionless way. It's immutable. It's a, it's a verifiable, true picture of what is um, the truth but the personal data is only on there in an encrypted way. Now, encrypted data is still personal data for the purposes of the blockchain in many ways without, haven't got enough time to go into the details now, but GDPR has a concept of pseudonymization. And in that sort of situation where it's encrypted, but there is a key for you to unlock it, then the encrypted data on the chain with access to the key means that it's still personal data for GDPR, but it's significantly easier to comply with GDPR if what you have on the blockchain is the hash rather than the personal data itself. Um, so we have, as I said, private permission blockchain. We keep as much 
personal data off the chain as possible. One of the amazing things that um, Jody's solution at MTI does is it uses or it, it proposes to use AI and other um, sophisticated technology to actually prevent people from uploading personal data onto the blockchain, except where it is absolutely necessary for the purposes. And you can already hear there the language of the GDPR. Don't upload it onto the chain unless it's absolutely necessary for the purposes. So people may want to, for example, upload uh, someone's name or email contact details where they don't need to do that. The middleware technology will block that. So that is another privacy by design solution that will help Jody's technology to remain GDPR compliant. Um, I mentioned the governance framework and by having a set of rules between the various stakeholders, those who are running the nodes of the blockchain, um, we can ensure compliance with GDPR around things like um, making sure that the information, the fair processing information is provided to all individuals at all times. So if data is going to be processed on the blockchain, each of the individuals will have access to information about who those stakeholders are. They will know how people can get hold of the hash keys in order to see personal information and the security around the access to those hash keys will be controlled as well. And also, all of the contractual provisions that are required, the model clauses to enable data to be transferred outside of the European Union and across borders can be included in the governance framework and the governance contractual arrangements. So Dave alluded to it earlier with the joint venture, but by having some sort of venture, the consortium members around the blockchain signing up to a significant governance framework really can go a long way to ensuring GDPR compliance. Um, we then get to, uh, I suppose, the, the, the hardest elements of GDPR compliance, which are, as we talked about earlier, these individual rights, like the right to be forgotten or the right to have incorrect data um, rectified. And these are most difficult because inherent in the technology, this immutability, is, in effect, not deleting data. The data will be there for all time. And so the question is, how can we really get over this? How can we make uh, a blockchain solution like this comply with these? Well, there are certain technology solutions, um, pruning the blockchain, where after a period of time, if you like, the historical elements of it can be snipped off uh, or by using significant um, encryption technology, which, which can't be reversed or the keys are destroyed. Uh, technology that MTI are talking about adopting around forking the chain, uh, which again, it's where you get all of the stakeholders or all of the nodes within the blockchain to agree that a historical part of it will be set to one side and the blockchain will literally fork off in another direction. These are all potential ways of ensuring that historical data can be, in effect, deleted. Um, but it still leaves us with a potential problem because as an individual, if I have the right to have my data deleted, I can ask for that at any time. And the relevant data controllers have to respond to that and delete the data within 30 days. And the methods around pruning or forking are not easy. They take a significant amount of technology and significant amount of computer power and time and resources. And so our, um, if you like, combined suggestion for MTI was keep the data off the blockchain if you can. If you have to have data on the blockchain, do it on a hash basis. And then if people uh, do have a right to have their data deleted, bearing in mind you can only have your data deleted where it's no longer relevant for the purposes. And the argument, I suppose, in this solution will be the historical record of the data will remain relevant for a long time. You can think of scenarios where somebody may have been recorded as being the shipper of certain cargo which they no longer want to be recorded on. Maybe it was erroneous, maybe it was in error and it needs to be rectified. And in that situation, our suggestion, and this is where we have a challenge for the regulators, our suggestion is that having um, 
all of the data on the blockchain in encrypted hashed form and then in effect requiring all of the stakeholders in this joint venture, all of the nodes of the blockchain to delete the keys that would enable you to decrypt the data, in effect that data is deleted. It is no longer possible to decrypt the data, not without a significant amount of computer power which would not be at the hands of you know, any particular individual and at that basis, we would say that the data is virtually deleted. Now, there are differences of opinion within the European data world as to whether strong encryption and throwing away the key is sufficient to achieve deletion. Certainly the pre-runner pre to the European Data Protection Board before the GDPR took the view a few years ago that strong encryption is not in itself sufficient or strong encryption and destruction of the key is not in itself sufficient to be deletion. But of course that guidance was given five years ago, four or five years ago. And our call to the regulator now is that we need to update that. And if you look at, at some of the um, some of the views coming out of France and Germany and the UK around the blockchain community, the view is that a, a use of strong encryption technology and an ability to delete the keys is all that would be required. So I suppose in, a, in summary on that point, and if you read the, the report that Sean um, introduced at the beginning of the webinar, there are two versions of it, but what we boil down to is we say, you know, I suppose the question is, did we succeed in our task? Uh, CGE and Slaughter Remain Pravath taken together, did we succeed in our task of proving that GDPR and blockchain can live together? I think the answer is pretty much. Um, there are a number of steps that you can take, which we've outlined in this presentation, in particular using a private permission blockchain and keeping as much data off the chain as possible and having a strong governance framework. But at the end of the day, what we've also done is raise the challenge to the regulators to say, help us, those of us who are trying to implement blockchain solutions, help us by giving us clarity. Tell us that it is okay to achieve deletion by having very strong encryption on hashed data on the blockchain and throwing away the key. And that's why I'm looking at the EBPB in their 10th plenary yesterday when they're discussing blockchain in a hope that having read our paper, they will be giving us a positive response. So that was a very quick rattle through our advice to MTI and now over to Dave and to Sean to add anything else. Yeah, thanks Rob. I, no, nothing really to add here because that was a great um, summary. Just, uh, you know, again, top line, keep the PII off chain as Rob said, use a hash on chain so that you can verify that the, the off chain PII is correct. To keep the PII off chain, Use technical measures, that's the middleware in the case of MTI that technically avoids putting, enabling PII to come on chain, and use business measures through the structure of the JV, the governance that's set up to require participants not to put PII on chain. So I'll stop there. I think, uh, uh, John, you want to come back on with the next section? Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Rob, and thank you, Dave. Uh, one, one point that we can't emphasize, I think, strongly enough is that it was, it's very, very difficult to be compli GDPR compliant on anything but a private blockchain. So there's lots of uh, public ones out there, but uh, you don't know where the data resides, you don't know where the ledgers are, you don't know who has access to that, and you just, uh, you, you got to be on a private chain to, uh, to be GDPR compliant. So let's... Uh, a uh, couple questions here, uh, Rob. I I know you uh, you need to run, uh, so maybe Dave and I can uh, can uh, talk a little bit uh, about uh, questions that uh, in my travels have uh, have arisen um, from uh, from people interested in the subject. You know, the first uh, and Rob Rob, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine for another five minutes, so I'm going to try oh. and help answer some questions with you for five, and then apologies that I do have to run on the hour. Okay, great. Uh, well, the first question, I, and, and you hit this during the uh, during the course of the uh, of the presentation a little bit, but uh, the question I'm most frequently asked is uh, a GDPR that that just applies to B to C, so I'm not impacted. 
impact in buy it my B2B business, am I? Uh, Rob, your thoughts on that? Uh, good question. So, um, yeah, so you broke up a bit, but I think what you were saying was, uh, is it right that the that, that GDPR already applies to B2C businesses? The answer is no, that's, that's not the case. So it applies also to B2B. Just, it's, it's actually quite simple. Uh, GDPR uh, is the regulation which regulates the processing of personal data, as we call it. Uh, personal uh, identifiable information, I think, is how it's better known in some other jurisdictions, PII. But it doesn't matter whether that personal data is being um, processed as part of a consumer-facing business or a B2B. And you know, MTI is a good example here. There are going to be individuals who are acting in a business capacity, but they are responsible for um, shipping goods and for taking certain steps to ship goods. And their personal identifiers, which, by the way, of course, will include their name, their, their image, their signature, their email address, but also their, uh, their, their transactional history and actually their um, other things. So their IP addresses, you know, so the, you, the history of their, um, uh, of their behavior and online can all be identifiers. Now, you know, for this reason, those of my clients that are B2C clients do tend to spend more time, money, effort, energy, and sleepless nights worrying about GDPR because they are processing the data of hundreds of thousands of consumers. But as a B2B business, you will be processing the data of individuals. And also, by the way, you'll be processing the data of your employees. And so it is, in short, it applies to all companies and other entities that process PII. Okay, Th thank you, Rob. Uh, one additional question here that I think is probably on the top of everyone's mind is, is you mentioned during the, during the presentation that we've got a regulation, but the regulatory bodies aren't in a position to provide a lot of guidance right now. So what advice are you, uh, are, are you giving your clients, uh, Rob and Dave? <laughs> We're making it up. No, no. <laughs> Uh, look, so first of all, to be clear, I mean, the law, the law is the law and the regulation uh, is quite detailed. You know, it's a big, it's a big weighty piece of legislation and there's a lot of words and a lot of recitals. So uh, um, also a lot of the guidance that applied before the GDPR with the old European directive as it was then um, is still applicable, or at least we're taking it as applicable there's also a fair amount of case law. So in, in many people's view, one of the things the regulation did is that it codified the law that had come around through case law. Uh, and so it's not true to say that there's sort of a complete absence of guidance. It's just that it's, it's slowly coming through. I, so, so we're, you know, I think, I suppose what I would say is there is, um, if you take the view that the purpose of the regulation is to ensure that we protect individuals' rights, but it's not intended to prevent companies doing good business. People like Dave and myself and, and firms like Cravath and Slaughter May, we take a very sort of pragmatic view of this. We help businesses to find a way through. The, you know, there should always be a way through to be able to comply. Um, and uh, the other thing I'd say is, because the guidance is being designed and developed as we speak, there's a really good opportunity for everybody, people like CGE, law firms like Dave's and, and mine, and also people like MTI and others to actually engage with the regulators and the legislators to define that guidance. So on an industry basis and an, on, a, on, a, on a jurisdictional basis, companies uh, and individuals are consulting with regulators to try and uh, define the guidance. So it's an, it is an exciting time. Okay, thank you, Rob. And uh, we're drawn to the end of an, our hour here. Maybe uh, I can ask one last question here. And that's around uh, additional legislation, particularly in the US and uh, in China. Are we seeing that uh, other countries are piggybacking on the EU legislation? And is this something that, uh, that you should factor into your, uh, your future design, uh, no, matter, uh, no matter where you are in the world? Or where yeah, you are in the world? Yeah, Sean, uh, Dave here, and I'll help with that one. And I think to start with your last question, the answer is emphatically yes. Um, you should design PII in um, to your solutions no matter where you're operating. And the reason I say that is because, number one, 
Uh, if you're a global business, you are touching on Europe almost certainly, as we have said several times in this presentation. But even if you're not, jurisdictions all over the world are following the EU, um, and we're very much in a global wave situation. Um, in the U.S., the state of California, which is the world's sixth largest economy, even though it's only a single state here, so it holds considerable sway in its own right, um, has passed a PII law that is in many ways modeled after the GDPR. It goes into effect next year. Um, uh, other country, other states in the U.S. are working on legislation. <laughs> the, uh, I'm aware of around 10 um, committees of jurisdiction in Congress that have or are putting together approaches, some of which will result in legislation. It's very likely that in the U.S. we'll have federal legislation probably in this term of Congress, so within you know the next year and a half or so. Uh, and then if you go outside the U.S., Brazil has um, its own version of the GDPR that it has put in place and is standing up to implement. And other countries are looking at it as well. So I think before we're done, and sooner rather than later, we are going to see uh, GDPR-like laws on a global basis. And that's why we ought to all just um, come into compliance and implement um, uh, uh, IT legal governance approaches that comply with GDPR from the beginning. Okay, thank you, Dave. And I'd like to thank you, Dave, and, and, and you, Rob, for an excellent and very informative hour. Uh, my apologies to the audience for uh, not being able to take questions. Uh, we will set up a blog on the, uh, on the DSCI website where you can submit questions and we will get you answers to, uh, to those. Uh, and in addition, we will upload today's presentation to, uh, to our website and make that available to you. So thank you all for your participation. Uh, it, was, uh, it was an excellent and informative hour. Uh, hope you all have, uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Yep, bye-bye.